Good morning. Hey, my name is John Teague. I'm one of the pastors here. If we have not met, and Friday morning, I was driving one of my daughters to school, and I was sitting at a red light, and when the light turned green, the guy behind me whips it out and around me and comes up next to me, looks at me, and then guns it, gets in front of me, and then disappears before the lanes could merge into one lane. And uh, I, I can still remember the look on your face, Brad, when, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It wasn't, it wasn't Brad. It wasn't Brad, but it could have been one of you. Uh, I still remember the look on the guy's face as he like woo, comes out around me and then I can hear the whine of his little Honda engine. It's like, what? It's like, you know, and the, the RPMs going as he just busted it out in front of me. It was the look and the sound of someone with no breathing room. And I have so been that guy. And if you're honest, You've been that guy too, right? On the road, like, first, why is it that we think that when, when, we, when someone is kind of going too slow for us, that, that, that they deserve a look, you know? Like, what is it that we're wanting to communicate in that look? Who let you onto my earth, you know? Like, you are in my way. And the reason is because we don't have breathing room. You know, we're running around like crazy, one thing to the next, we're... You know, we're late, we're leaving early, we're getting to the end of the day or maybe the end of the week and we're out of breath and we're out of time. We've crammed our calendars so full that we barely enjoy anything because we're trying to do everything. Or maybe we just get to the end of the week and we feel discouraged because it seems like we were really busy, but nothing we wanted to accomplish actually happened. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like that? Well, last week we started to talk about this idea of breathing room. You know, it's that, ah, it's what we all long for, whether that's in our schedules or our finances or our relationships. And we define breathing room like this. If you weren't here last week, this will catch you up. Breathing room is the space between our current pace and our limits. The space between our current pace and our limits. So it's the space between how fast we're going, how fast we're spending, how complex our relationships may be, and, and that point where, you know, we either freak out or just shut down because we all have limits. And when there's no space, there's no breathing room. And when there's no breathing room, stress expands, right? Right? When there's no breathing room, joy, at least on the surface, just evaporates. When there's no breathing room, relationships explode. And I imagine you've been there. As I was thinking about this this week, I, I couldn't help but think about uh, date nights for my wife and I. It seems so often that, because we rarely get a date. We don't get a date enough. And it seems like so often this is, this is what will happen. We've got a babysitter and the babysitter arrives at the right time. And then, you know, they start to chat and, you know, we love our babysitters and they're catching up on life, you know, and, and, you know, talking about where the frozen pizza is and, you know, all, how to turn the oven on. Like all these people know these things. They're, they're, they're grown adults, you know, and, and they're talking and they're chatting and I'm out in the car like, you know, like, let's get out of here. And then, you know, we finally leave and we're running late. And I'm thinking about traffic that is starting to pile up on the interstate with, with uh, you know, the rush hour and the place where we want to go, where we always want to go. It fills up really fast and it's hard to get a table. And, and I'm starting to grip the steering wheel tighter and tighter. And I'm so glad we're doing this. No breathing room. No breathing room. That's what it feels like. But we were created for breathing room. In fact, Chris talked about this last week when God established the nation of Israel so many years ago in the Old Testament, he gave his people a bunch of commandments, a few hundred of them actually, but he highlighted 10 of them and one of them was you will take a day off. He called it the Sabbath. It was God's way of saying, I've designed you to function best when you've got room to breathe. 
But our brokenness and our sin makes that hard because we struggle. We struggle to create breathing room in our lives because we struggle to trust God with every area of our lives. And these things are connected. Our willingness to create margin or breathing room in our lives, are, it's, it, that, that's connected to our faith and trust in him that he will provide. And so our inclination is just to cram it all in. And we run around all week and we're sending texts, you know, like I might be a few minutes late or like, you know, we're not even in the car yet. And we're like on my way, you know, and, and kids are going in all different directions with all the things that they've got going on. And we're chucking chicken nuggets at them in the back seat, you know, (laughs) maybe you're single, you know, and you're just like, you have a hard time saying no to anything. And someone asks you to do something, you're like, yeah. And then you're like, why did I say yes and commit myself to that? Surely there's another way. There is another way, right? Well, I've been thinking about this a lot in the new year because I have finally come to admit that uh, I don't make good choices. I mean, if I don't have a plan, for instance, a guide for how I eat, I'm a total donkey. I just, like, if I don't have a plan, I just eat whatever, like, you know, like there's no tomorrow. I mean, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, right? It's biblical, right? So if I don't have a plan, I don't eat well. Same thing's true for my time. If I don't plan my time, it just gets out of control. I don't even feel like I have anything to show for it. And the things that are most important don't seem to get done. Maybe you feel that way too. And here's the thing. As I've been thinking about this, there's some things that I know I want to happen. Some things that I know I want to be. I know that I wanna be a loving husband to Katie. I'm the only one she's got. If I'm not gonna do it, she doesn't get it. I know I wanna be a loving husband. I know I wanna be a great dad. I'm the only dad those three little girls have. And I know that a big part of my job is to point them to God. And that's a, that's a big responsibility. And I want to do that well. And I know that I want to be a faithful pastor because you guys need it. <laughs> I know I've got a limited number of hours and days and years to get all of that done. And every now and then, when I have a little breathing room, I come up for air, I realize I don't really live like that's true. I don't really live like my time is limited. I don't really live like I only have so many Saturdays left before my girls fly away. I don't really live like I only have so many opportunities to connect with you and try to gather you and connect before something happens and you're gone. I'm not guaranteed 50 more years with my bride. I'm not even guaranteed tomorrow. So if we have limited time, kind of like our bank accounts, there's, a, there's limited funds in there. If we, if we have a limited amount of time, the question is, how are we gonna spend it? We need to do it wisely. And I need help. And maybe you do too. That's why I'm encouraged by one of the heroes of the faith, Moses, way back in the Old Testament. He prayed a prayer. We talked about this back in December, but Psalm 90 verse 12 captures Moses' prayer. He says this to God, teach us to number our days. Or another way to say it, teach us to live as if our days are numbered so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days. Now, you've done this before. I mean, if you've ever had a wedding day, I mean, brides, you for sure have done this. You know, if you, if you are engaged to be married or, or, you know, you can remember that season where there was a deadline. There was a day when you knew it was gonna happen. And so you had to back up and think and plan, you know, when are we gonna have the caterers and, you know, the, the photographer landed and all those kinds of things. And you're sort of, you know, the guys are just kind of watching going, when are we leaving for our honeymoon? That's all I care about right? But you knew that there was a day that was coming, right? You knew that if you ever had to take an exam in school, and for some of you, this is right where you're at, brother, you can kind of remember back, you know, you knew when the, when the exam was going to happen because you got the syllabus and you saw it. And so you, you, you planned out when you were going to study, right? I mean, I've heard people do this. (laughs) Anytime you've ever had a deadline, maybe it was just at work. You knew that your time was limited. There would be a time when you would not be able to do it 
any more. What if we live that way? Because as Moses prayed, if we will learn how to live as if our days are numbered, then we might gain a heart of wisdom. We'll begin to, to see what we need to leave in, what we need to leave out. Begin to see what should be a priority. And we begin to think like, wait a minute, I, I don't need to be spending all my time doing that. I need to be spending more time doing this. Teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. But then the question becomes, is there a template for this? Like, how do we gain this heart of wisdom? You know, like, is there a target I should be shooting at? Is there someone who's actually embraced their limited time and was able to spend that time wisely? Well, I propose that we look at the life of Jesus, who was an incredibly busy man with very limited time and yet seemed to have never wasted a moment. You know, the, the gospel writers, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John there in your New Testament, they present Jesus as someone who is just under constant pressure from everyone. Friends, enemies, family. It's like every word scrutinized, every action is being monitored. But you get the feeling as you study the life of Jesus that he was never hurried. He was never playing catch up. He had time to be alone. He had time to spend with friends. He had time to go to dinner parties and teach and listen and heal. What was guiding Jesus? What did he know that helped him manage such a demanding schedule? Well, I think three things that I wanna communicate to you this morning. The first is this. Jesus knew his purpose. Jesus knew precisely why he came into the world. And he said it in all kinds of ways, but I'll just, I'll just give you a couple examples right here. In Luke chapter four, Jesus is stepping onto the scene in his public ministry. He's been baptized. He's gone out in the wilderness. He's fasted for 40 days and, and, and met with the Lord there. He was tempted by Satan there. He comes back into the synagogue and, and he stands up and he says this in Luke four, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me and then he's gonna lay out his mission. This is his purpose, to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He said it even more succinctly in, later in Luke in chapter 19, verse 10. He said, for the son of man, speaking of himself, came to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. That's why he was on earth. Everything on his schedule was about that purpose. It's what drove him every single day. I don't know, maybe you have pictures uh, from, from long ago in a, in a Sunday school classroom where Jesus is just like, you know, he's chill. He's got a lamb on his shoulders. You know, this beautiful flowing brown hair and well-groomed beard. And he's just like, you just sort of picture like he's like a peace child, you know? I, I, I think Jesus was pretty driven. I think he knew exactly what he had to do. And I think he knew he had a limited amount of time to do it. When you have clarity on your purpose, you can have wisdom in how you use your limited time. Of course, that's the big question, right? What's my purpose? I mean, that's a question that over 30 million people have asked because that's how many copies have been sold of Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. That thing has gone like gangbusters since it was first published because everyone wants to know, what on earth am I here for? And how do I live into that purpose? And that purpose will help us have clarity and wisdom on how we use our time. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. He said, for the love of Christ controls us, has seized us, has gripped us, because we have concluded this, that one, Jesus, has died for all, 
And therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. If you want to know what your purpose is, this is a great place to start, especially if you are a follower of Christ. If you are a Christian, if you have trusted Jesus Christ to be your savior, to take on your sin, to give you forgiveness and grace and eternal life. You have a new purpose. You have been given new life. Jesus called it abundant life. And Paul says right here that we no longer live for ourselves. We live for him who for our sake died and was raised. So if you believe in a a personal God who's got a personal plan for you, That means that God's got something for you, for your family, your kids. He's got something for you in this season that is hard. Maybe you're single. He's got something for you and purpose for you in this. And it it has to do with you no longer living for yourself, but living for him. And God is faithful to reveal that to us as we trust him with our valuable asset of time. Jesus knew what his purpose was and it drove him every single day. Here's the second thing that Jesus knew. If purpose was sort of the big picture, the next thing he knew were his plans. This this would be like, how am I gonna accomplish that purpose? This is the daily decisions and we see it all throughout the gospel in Jesus's life. He was always pulling back and getting away to spend time with his heavenly father. Mark chapter one records a version of this in verse 35. Mark said, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and he went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. Jesus was always getting away, spending time alone with his father. And Simon and those who were with him, they were, they were looking for him. They were like, where is Jesus? They finally found him and they said to him, everyone is looking for you, right? Like everyone needs to see you. They've, they've got something they need from you. Like, you know, these are probably all really good things that are going on, but, but, but Jesus has, has carved time away. And then he said to them, let's go on to the next town. He's moving on from the place where everyone's looking for him. We got to go to the next town for that's why I came out. This is mentioned so many times and especially by Mark, and if you know anything about the gospel of, of Mark, it is, all, it is all action. It's like suddenly, then, immediately. And yet Mark is also quick to point out just how often Jesus gets away to spend time with his father, especially when there were big decisions, especially when he needed to choose the 12 disciples, especially when there was a lot going on. He got away to pray think we can learn something from Jesus about how we spend our limited time. In the gospel of John, we see Jesus making a lot of statements about where he gets his plans. In John 5, 19, we get an example of this. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. Now, in this particular scene, Jesus had come up to a place called the Pool of Bethesda. And it's where John says that there was a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And they're all laying around this pool because they all believed in this sort of superstitious idea that an angel would come down and would, would, you know, stir up the waters and people would get healed. And Jesus comes upon this place and he sees all of these people and then he heals one man. He sees one man out of all of these people who need help. And I don't think that was just random or by accident. I don't think Jesus just woke up that morning and just took off wandering around and just happened to be at the pool of Bethesda, just bumped into that guy and decided to heal him. I think that in those moments when Jesus would get up and go to pray, he was asking the Lord. He was saying, give me a sense of what 
my day is supposed to look like. He was submitting his plans and his day to God and asking him to guide his steps. That's why he says, I only do what I see my father doing. God's given me a picture of what this is supposed to look like. He would go on to say later, hey, I say what I hear the father saying. It's this time with God. Is getting away to pray. He's carving out this time in his busy, busy schedule. And I think we can do the same. I mean, what if, though I know our time is limited and though I know that we don't feel like we've got enough time in the day, what if we started the day a little earlier than we have to? And we got alone with God. We opened up our Bibles and we began to read about who he is and what those plans and purposes are for our lives. And then we begin to pray and we just sort of lay out our day. We know what's coming. We know like we got to do the carpool thing here at the end of the day. And, or we know we got this test coming up or I know I've got these appointments in my work schedule today. I know it's going to be a long day. God, I need your help. God, I need you to give me wisdom to juggle all that I've got, the busyness of this day or this week. God, I need you to help me to make the most of this carpool situation while I've got the kids in the car. How can I make the most of this? How can I speak life and encouragement into these kids? Will you give me eyes to see people? See where you're at work, how I can join you and love others. And then you've got a clear sense of your plan for the day. And yes, your, your schedule's busy but you begin to see how God wants to use that limited time. And even when everyone's looking for you as they were for Jesus or everyone's texting you or everyone's posting on your picture and notifications are flying in like crazy on your phone, you'll know what's most important today because you know your purpose, because you know what your plans are. You're allowing the Lord to speak into those things. And you're going to seek first his kingdom. And all this leads me to the third thing we see in Jesus. Jesus ruthlessly protected his time. Because if you don't know your purpose and you don't have a plan, someone else will gladly provide one for you, right? I mean, there's plenty of people that would love to, you know, dictate your schedule for the day and your time will get filled up and spoken for by all the people around you and by the, the billions of distractions that come our way just because of these little things we carry around in our pockets. And one of the most obvious examples we see in Jesus's life is in Matthew 16. He's just had this epic conversation with his disciples. You might remember it. He's like, hey, so who do people think that I am? And they're kind of talking about it. He's like, well, who do you think that I am? And, you know, Peter has this moment of epiphany. who's like, you are the Christ. You are the son of God. And Jesus is like, yes, that's right. And so Jesus begins to start to open up a little bit and reveal a little bit more of why he came, what his purpose was. He, he says in, in Matthew 16, 21, Jesus began to show his disciples that he's got to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. And then he's going to be killed. And on the third day, he's going to be raised. He's revealing his purpose. This is what's driving Jesus. These are his plans. What he's going to do with his limited time on earth. And then Peter. Yeah, I love Peter. So he's like, Jesus. No, 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 no. No, Jesus. That'll never happen to you. We won't let that happen to you, Jesus. He says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned, Jesus did, and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Whoa. Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance. That kind of thinking is in the way of what I came to do, my purpose. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Jesus is saying, no, Peter, this is exactly what I must do. And yeah, it's gonna be hard, but this is my purpose. It's what the Father's told me that, that I need to do. So, you know, the next time somebody emails you or sends you a message about a problem that's not on your priority list, you just respond back to them, get behind me, Satan. But seriously, 
I wouldn't do that. Jesus <laughs> had to protect his time. And if we want breathing room, so do we. I've had to take some serious defensive measures to protect my time this year. As my plate gets busier and my family gets busier and more active and into all kinds of really good things, I have to think about how I'm spending my time and I have to think about the, the kinds of things that sort of fly into my life and, and distract me from what's most important. And I've had to kind of set up like a, you know, like a surface to air missile defense system and sort of blow those, those distractions out of the sky. And there are a couple of things for me and maybe, maybe this relates to you or maybe you've got other things that, you know, these distractions that come in that you need to blow out of the sky. For me, one of them was email. Email, now I know that a lot of you don't check your email like, I know, and it's frustrating. Um, but some of you check it all the time, right? Like the door's wide open and those emails just sort of fly in and hit you in the face, you know? It's just like all the time. And that was me. And, and I'd open my inbox at the beginning of the day and before I could do anything about it, everyone had planned my day with their urgent matters. And even if I had other priorities, those emails had this way of feeling like a ticking time bomb that I, I have to disarm. And I know that even as I say that, it makes me feel like way more, it makes me sound way more responsible than I am. The reality is I was just addicted to little dopamine hits, you know, like when that message or that alert, that notification comes in, it's like, ooh, something new, check it out. Oh, it's a problem, you know, like, like it was killing my productivity, it was causing stress, it was eating into my breathing room and then I was just like putting all this stuff in my backpack and carried around with me all day and it was stressing me out. So I had to, I had to set up a, a boundary, a plan for my time and I only checked my email in these specific windows throughout the day. And when I do it, I just, I decide I'm, I'm gonna do it right then. I'm gonna delegate it either to my to-do list or to somebody else or I'm gonna delete it. That has helped me manage my time. Another thing that I'm doing to protect my time, and perhaps this is something you've done or might consider doing, is I've, I've gone on a fast from social media in January. And uh, social media is not the enemy, you know, don't hear, and don't hear me being self-righteous uh, in that because I've already told you I have a problem. You know, like I don't make good choices. And so I would find myself, you know, like in the bathroom in the dark, you know, like with this glow and I'm like, you know, and my, my family's like, John, like, where are you? You were just right here. I handed you a dish to dry, you know? And then like you disappeared. And like, I kind of woke up like from like, what happened? Where am I? You know, like, I don't know. Has that ever happened to you? Like, or like the worst is, um, okay, this is, I'm gonna tell myself. The worst is like, in the, you know, when you're in the bathroom with the uh, automatic, lights, you know, and you're the only one in there. And then, you know, you've been in there too long when, uh, you know, the lights go off and now you're in the dark, right? And thank goodness these things have flashlights. That's all I'm saying. I mean, I've heard about that kind of thing happening to people, but, but anyway, I, I, I realized I had a problem, you know? And, and so, so I, I needed to do something about it. I needed to protect my time. And I know that one of my purposes this year is to experience life with my kids and I don't want them to see me doing this all the time. I don't need to be all caught up. You know, like that's how like Instagram tells you, like all caught up. And I'm like, oh, now what am I gonna do? You know, be alone with my thoughts or my kids, you know, like pay attention to my spouse. We have to protect our time. We have to plan our time. We have to submit our time to God's purposes for our lives. And that's so important. You know, I mean, as you start thinking about breathing room in your schedule, you could be like, yes, you know what this means? Goodbye, serving a kids ministry. I got to serve some breathing, right? No, Christy's like, no, goodbye, setup team, right? You know, like I got to create some breathing room. Sabbath, yeah, goodbye, small group, hello, Netflix, right? I mean, like, that could be like, I need some breathing room, you know? Like, I gotta catch up on Madam Secretary. And those might be good things. But here's the deal. Breathing room isn't just about doing less in our limited time. I think breathing room is actually about doing more of what's important with our limited time. T. 
teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Do you know your purpose? Maybe for this year, maybe for this month. Have you invited God into those plans? Have you taken some time, just perhaps at the beginning of every day, just to let him speak into all that is on that schedule or all that's coming up in the week to come? We gotta protect that. So what? I've been frustrated at home lately. I felt like in a lot of ways, I have no idea what I'm doing as a parent. I have a teenager, a middle schooler. Ironically, I used to help parents of middle schoolers for like a decade. I used to give them all kinds of advice and wisdom. Now that I'm a parent of a middle schooler, clueless. I have no idea what I'm doing. As my littles are getting not so little anymore as they're getting older and we're entering kind of a new busy season of life. I'm like, what does parenting look like right now? I know what it used to look like when we would all gather around and they would just, you know, sort of eat out of my hand as I, as I read the Bible to them, you know, and like we looked at the little kid Bibles and it was just like everybody, yeah, and now it's getting harder. I know that God has placed me as a leader in my home. I know that I have to point my kids to Jesus If you're a mom or a dad, you've got that same purpose and mission. We have not been reading the Bible as a family like I want to. In fact, it's almost been non-existent if I'm really honest about that. It's hard, you know, the struggle is real. So Thursday at dinner, you know, I'm forced to think about all this. I got limited time. What am I gonna do with it, right? Because I have to preach this to you on Sunday. And I'm thinking Thursday at dinner, I was just kind of like, that's it. That's it. I reminded my kids, we've got a value here in our family. Like we've got this word, it's on our wall, joyful. And the U, it's like an acrostic. And the U in joyful stands for understanding God's word. We want to be that as a family, but we're not doing that. And I explained to my kids that, that I have a, a, an old pastor, Pastor Brad in Knoxville. He used to say all the time that, that if you've got a value, you better build a structure around that value or you don't really have a value. And so we talked about that. What's the structure we're gonna build around this value in our home? And we decided that we're gonna start reading the Bible during dinner. Pulled one of those from my friend Brad. Reading the Bible at dinner. Because, you know, we've got limited time and we've got crazy schedules and so do you. So when are you gonna do it? You know, are you just gonna like, just cut something off? You know, like, you can't do sports anymore. We got to read the Bible as a family. You know, I mean, like, that's probably not going to work. So what the time that I do have, how am I going to use it? I I share that with you because I, I, what I want you to see is that, that our, our purpose and our, our priorities, they, they need to, they need to direct our plans and how we use our time. And then we have to protect that to build structures around our time so that we, we can step into all that God has for us. And then we will feel like we have breathing room to do all those things that we want to do. Jesus knew what was most important. And what was most important was to come rescue us. He came to show us who God is. He came to die for us. And nothing was gonna get in the way. So how are we doing with that? How are we doing with our time? The bottom of your bulletin, there's a little homework assignment that I want you to look at. There's some symbols there. We're not gonna do math, but we are gonna think about what God might have us add into our schedules. What might we need to add that we need to, put in there to help us discover our purpose, prioritize our lives, get to those things that we know God's put on our heart. What do we need to add? There might be something we need to subtract. Something that we've been doing that we don't need to do anymore. That might actually be a relationship, a person, something that's 
you know, creating pain or a drain in your life. It may be something that you need to do more of. God's saying, hey, I want you to do a little more of this. This is where I want you to lean in in this season. It might be something you need to do less of. Not wipe it off the schedule, but just do less of. And then you might have to create some structures around these things to make sure that these things happen. But remember this, the love of Christ controls us. If you are a follower of Jesus, we believe that he died for us. And therefore we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who for his, for our sake died and was raised. He has a plan for our time. It is a good plan if we'll trust him with that. Let me pray for us.